Hmm. Okay, uh, I've been working on a, a range of topics uh, that attempt to build a bridge uh, between uh, basic uh, neurological science and social sciences. I'm particularly interested in like neurological programming of the social. Uh, my background uh, was uh, working uh, in a lab that was about as molecular as you could get, putting electrodes in nerve cells and tissue culture. Uh, and I was very much interested in the development and evolution of motor systems. And uh, some people were wondering about why did I quit doing the work that I used to do, very reductionistic, and start to look at things like yawning and laughter. But uh, the yawning and laughter project were really a direct, uh, a direct evolution of the work that I'd been doing with animal systems and of a mo more molecular sort. Because I believe that if you looked at human, ongoing human behavior in the right way, you looked at the right things, you could bring the same kind of rigor uh, to behavioral studies. Uh, and uh, so what you're going to get today is a, a sample of that Actually, it's what I call sidewalk neuroscience. What you can learn about the brain and behavior by uh, looking at ongoing uh, behavior of humans. So uh, I'm going to be talking specifically today uh, about what uh, ongoing laughter uh, descriptions can tell us about the evolution of not only human-style laughter, uh, but speech itself. Uh, other elements of this program have involved, I have to apologize for uh, the cute crude AV. I bought a new system uh, a week or two ago, and uh, the graphics don't want to transfer uh, to the new systems. One of the places, uh, one of the themes we've been looking at, illustrated here, particularly interested in uniquely human behaviors. Because if you look at uh, behaviors that uh, humans have, they're not shared with other animals, it allows you to go beyond talking about selecting for or against traits and so on and deal with the uh, evolution of specific organismic changes. And one of the things we looked at, for example, uh, was the evolution of the whites of the eyes, uh, the white sclera. Only uh, humans uh, uh, have a white sclera. We have other humans here. Uh, it's an exercise of ours with uh, Photoshop. We simply extended the iris out with that coloration to fill uh, the entire area of the orbit. Looks rather bizarre. Actually, some students in the lab uh, thought this whole business was rather distasteful, and they found looking at these, interests, uh, these images disturbing. But I said disturbing is good, because disturbing means you've tapped in to a particularly significant uh, channel of information. Uh, Tomasello uh, and some others had talked about directional gaze hypotheses about whether by uh, shifting your gaze to the right or the left, uh, you, you could uh, direct attention to others in your group to things, or you might even fake them out by looking, misdirecting them. Uh, other primates uh, can't signal such, send such information. Uh, because they have dark sclera. Uh, information uh, signaled by the, uh, via the white sclera is a yellowing that's associated with liver disease, you know, so-called jaundice, which is uh, due to the accumulation of bilirubin, and also lipids. So older people have yellower uh, sclera, and uh, younger ones have whiter ones. In fact, uh, white sclera is uh, a measure of youth, health, and beauty. So uh, eye drops, for example, that get the white out or get the red out are actually beauty aids. Other animals don't have this. Uh, also, changes in scleral color, uh, for example, increases in redness are associated uh, with all uh, emotions uh, except surprise. If you're sick, you're going to have a red uh, sclera. Uh, if uh, 
you're sad, you're going to have a red sclera. Other animals don't have this channel open. And also, by looking at the color changes, they're primarily mediated by the conjunctiva, which is a thin, transparent membrane over the whites of the eyes. It's also the only place in the body where you can directly witness uh, cardiovascular dynamics. So with a macro lens, you can actually see the pulsing of blood vessels uh, through here. You can't do that any other place. Uh, in the oddness dimension, look what happens when you have total whites of the eyes. Or in this case, uh, only the pupil and you can't see the iris. Uh, this is what happens when you have Photoshop and spare time in your hands. Another case where we uh, were uh, looking for uniquely human behaviors. Whoops. Is tearing. Uh, only humans have tears of emotion. Uh, other animals will show tears uh, when there's uh, irritation of the eye or the person's sick. But uh, only humans have emotional tears. Again, this is an opportunity, instead of talking about selecting the for or against particular traits, which is fine, this is the population genetics model, where you can move on and talk about selecting for or against particular neural pathways, particular neurotransmitters. Okay, so what permitted this change? Uh, one of our studies here, uh, we found that if you start with pictures of teary individuals, actually we didn't do the study with cartoons, did it with many images of real people with tears. If you Photoshop the tears out, you end up with individuals, we did study of many people with this, uh, the individual not only looked less sad, uh, but looked often bewildered, in awe, puzzled, okay? So what it amounts to is you could basically redo the entire science of human facial expressions, uh, adding tears. Tears change everything. In fact, the uh, facial behavior is a rather crude instrument of communication. And tears allow you to sharpen this. But tears also appear uh, during sneezing, during coughing. Uh, during yawning, during laughing, and other kind of things. Rather interesting. But I believe that what we see is these emotional tears. Uh, this is evidence, uh, these are really footprints of a recently evolved behavior. So you want to see what evolution ha uh, looks like when it's happening right now. It's when it's sloppy and it hadn't been tuned up. So if you check back in 100,000 years, or 10,000 years, uh, we may not see uh, tearing occurring during laughter, uh, during sneezing, during yawning, and so on. So what you may be seeing here, this is what it looks like. This is brand new behavior, and this is why we get this sloppiness. This is what it looks like. Tears alone are not an important trigger, because if you have tears going up, for example, if you put uh, artificial tears, cosmetic tears, on the forehead and going up, person doesn't look sad, you wonder, what the heck is that? Is it sweat? Is it whatever? Uh, so uh, a lot of what we associate with tears, they have to be going down, can't be doing, going up. Uh, again, these are some other things that we looked at. Uh, uh, other uh, folk, uh, foci had been uh, yawning in its contagion, uh, vomiting in its contagion, uh, hiccuping, the uh, hiccups are not contagious. Uh, uh, itching is contagion. We've been looking at a lot of these kind of things because when you're looking at contagious behavior, you're looking at neurologically programmed social behavior. And looking at these behaviors uh, permits you to build a bridge uh, between the social and neurological sciences that typically hadn't been there. Because historically, the social sciences were sort of anti neurological is that uh, claiming neurological mechanism might be evidence of social Darwinism and ism so terrible to even contemplate. Okay? But uh, the uh, contagious behaviors uh, uh, have a lot to offer. Okay, the, the focus today is going to be 
using sidewalk neuroscience to get some insights uh, into the evolution of the human form of speech and also a uh, human form of laughter and also speech. So simply by observing what people do, such as your conversations between you uh, uh, at lunch, uh, you can get these kinds of insights. I realize I'm dealing with some laughter experts here and I'm going to be breezing rather quickly through that material, uh, focusing on we, what we can learn about evolution of the speech apparatus. Uh, we can come back to uh, some of the laughter issues uh, in the question period. Okay, Winnie, uh, the early efforts that I had to establish a kind of neuroscience of laughter uh, was marked by failure. Uh, it was really success uh, in disguise, however. So what I wanted to do as a neuroscientist to get people laughing and then analyze it with the same kind of rigor that you would get with walking, flapping, swimming, uh, other model systems for the production and control of uh, motor behavior. Okay, so I brought some people into the lab and I was going to show them some comedy videos and record their laughter and analyze it. Thing is, they weren't laughing. This was very frustrating because what I wanted to do is take those sounds and then uh, do acoustic analyses and uh, again treat laughter like walking. But what I realized, and it was uh, really uh, success disguised as failure, is I had to get out of the lab and look what people were doing. Now there wasn't much of a, an example of this, so we had to sort of learn by doing. So the next step was get out of the lab and look at what people were doing in public places. Students in the students, uh, si uh, student union, uh, city sidewalks, shop, suburban shopping malls, and so on. So we're going to record what was said before people laughed. Okay, And uh, let's give us insight into the you know, humorous stimuli triggers of laughter. And uh, again, I wasn't planning on doing a field study. I wanted to do neurophysiology. <laughs> and uh, here I was uh, suddenly uh, doing my Jane uh, Goodall bit, except in the suburban shopping malls in the student union. OK, uh, again, we met with failure. Well, actually, this isn't the dimension of failure I was looking at. Okay, uh, I was focusing on uh, dyads, a simple social group, you know, two people uh, conversing with each other. So uh, when we recorded uh, what was said before a person laughed, very con uh, disconcerting is people were laughing at things like, where have you been? Uh, Got to go now. <laughs> you know, I thought, Gee, this isn't very good. Stuff. Am I missing something? You know, are you gonna, people are going to say, well, you had to be there, you know, and all this kind of. And I was coming to the conclusion that laughter is really not very much about humor. So it turned out when we started to work the numbers on this, it's not about humor, it's about other people. If you're not around other people, laughter virtually disappears. Uh, uh, solitary laughter is 30 times less frequent uh, than social laughter. So it's about people, interactions with other individuals. It's not, uh, it's not really about humor. So after uh, our first study was 1,200 cases of nat naturally occurring laughter, uh, perhaps only 10 or 15 percent uh, could be roughly uh, considered uh, jokey pre-laugh comments. There were a few, you know, like actually one Steve Pinker, I believe, quoted in his How the Mind Works books. It was one of our all-time greats, was uh, Expression of True Love. Guy says, I'd pay a hundred dollars to wade through her shit. Okay, th these were the great moments in me. Another one is, uh, I didn't realize I was sitting in dog shit till I put my hand down to get up. Okay, well, th these were the best of 1,200 cases. Okay, it wasn't great. But most of it was like, where have you been? Got to go now. Uh, I have a class, things like that. Uh, do you have a rubber band? It's not great comedy material. 
like I say, if you want to describe conversational laughter in public places, it, it's like uh, looking at the laugh tracks associated with the world's worst situation comedies. Okay, that's the way it is. Okay, and laughter, of course, is also contagious. You laugh when other people laugh. Okay, so uh, most uh, laughter does not follow uh, jokes. A uh, striking thing about it, however, is uh, notice here, where have you been, ha, ha, ha. The uh, laughter uh, seldom interrupts the phrase structure of speech. This was a big surprise. So a person will say, I've got to go now, ha, ha, ha. They don't say, I've got to go, ha, 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 now. Uh, actually, this is an interesting and very important point. You think, gee, that's sort of cool. You know, the laughter doesn't intrude upon speech. And some people say, oh, yeah, I can think of a case where I was laughing so hard I couldn't finish the sentence. Yeah, you can think of the case. But I'm saying of 1,200 or so cases, it almost never happened. Okay? But, but this is sort of interesting. And so this uh, descriptive behavior is telling you something important about the brain, how the brain works. It's, yes? Do you, do you mind if we have interview a little bit? No, go ahead. Um, you can address this later, um, or we can talk about it later, but it's just about the idea that there's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing about humor here. Um, and we've talked about this a little before, but it's, he knows the answer to the question, and that's what's funny. And you don't, as an observer, so you don't see what's funny. That, that's true. That's true. So, uh, there, so you, you, I mean, I I'm not a big laughter is humor no. person, but I mean, um, it seems that a lot of humor is, is implicit. Yeah, it could be a shrug of the shoulders. It could be that you had to be there. Uh, it, it's for the most part, you know, I, I didn't really want to engage the issue of humor. Right. Is uh, People are not telling jokes to each other. And uh, another thing that we're going to learn is basically stand-up comedy is a very poor model uh, uh, for everyday laughter. Although uh, some humor researchers treat it if it's so. Uh, it, fa it fails in several levels. One is uh, most pre-laugh comments are not jokey. Again, I want to stay away from the issue of humor. That's, no, too, that's too hard for me. It's not too hard for you, but it's too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, another one is that the speaker, on average, laughs more than their audience. This was very disturbing. So I went out to do my field study because I couldn't get it in the lab, and I found that we're getting the uh, I gotta go now kind of stuff, and I think, oh, this is not working. And the damn speaker is laughing more than the audience. Again, uh, had to start again. So now we had to start again talking about a speaker and an audience. And I'm not talking about a theater audience. I just mean the speaker in a dyad is the person talking. The audience is the person they're talking to. And then, of course, they're switching roles in conversation. The speaker's laughing too. <laughs> had to start over. Now we had the speaker and the audience. Uh, so that was, uh, that was surprising, and we started to do this and got a lot of data here. But another thing had to happen, well, good grief, here I am, a neuroscientist having to become, become a social psychologist or an anthropologist. And uh, now I had to become a gender studies person. Because any time you're dealing with people talking to each other, you know, you're gonna, you know it's either going to be same or different sex. And this, this ended up uh, changing everything. We'll get, get, uh, get there in a minute. Gee, I don't need that. Okay, th this is a summary of what we found. We look at the uh, sex of the person uh, talking and who they're talking to. Both males and females uh, laugh quite a lot. It may be that females laugh a little bit more, but the key issue and the huge differences come when you look at uh, the sex of the speaker and uh, the audience. Uh, these results have been replicated in several other labs. And uh, I was a little uneasy about this, reporting these kind of things, because gender studies is not the kind of thing that I was doing. And it was comforting to find that other labs in other countries, like in Europe and so on, were finding uh, a similar thing. In fact, some cases it came 
so close, it was like uh, some of these uh, uh, data that I'm presenting were like within 1% of each other, I'm surprised. So here you have males talking to males, females talking to females. On average, the speaker lasts more than the audience, but the huge difference comes when you look at men and women talking to each other. I had one colleague that said, oh my God, the uh, cliche of the giggling female has been confirmed. Actually, I don't know about the, what that particular cliche might be, but we found that the most efficient laugh getter was a male talking to a female, uh, such as we have over here. The guy's laughing, the woman's laughing a lot. Now this is also uh, a likely reason why most comedians are male. Because in everyday conversation, uh, males are more efficient laugh getters than females. And I'm not saying that there aren't exceptions to this. Uh, obviously we're aware of female comedians. But on average, I think we're probably not looking at sexism in show business. We're looking at something that's true in everyday life. And worldwide, class clowns are almost always guys. Now there's a case where you can get uh, some data uh, from cross-cultural things that weren't really targeting laughter, but it's just mention of the class clowns. They're usually guys. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, the uh, most effective laugh getters are uh, males. Uh, female speakers are especially laugh a lot at males. This is, uh, this is interesting because laughter is not under conscious control. Typically, if this is another issue is particularly interested to Greg, but if you ask people to laugh in command, uh, uh, I found about half the people said they couldn't do it or weren't very effective at faking it. Actually, one way had of dealing with this is uh, recently completed a reaction time study uh, that showed that if you ask a person to laugh, uh, there's a fairly long lag as opposed to like triple the time is if you ask someone to say ha ha. You know, ask you, say ha ha. Uh -huh. Okay, w will you laugh for us now? No. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so th there uh, seems to be a, a different uh, process involved there. Yeah, first step uh, toward analyzing the uh, motor process was again, this is where uh, the kind of thing that I hope to be at at the beginning is uh, uh, this is a uh, frequency spectrum and this is a, a, a power uh, analysis. You have a ha 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 of the sort of the structural bones of laughter. You have a short burst here. It's about a fifteenth of a second, and they repeat about every fifth of a second. Uh, actually, if you edit out the what I call laugh notes, I did this in my recent papers because I didn't want to get uh, stuck in talking about what a, uh, a syllable would be. So I told them laugh notes. If you edit these out and close what's left, what you have left is a sigh. Here's a laughter without the laugh note. <sighs> okay. If you edit these sounds out, it still seems to sound like laughter. Now also, more so than speech, you can actually reverse this and play a laughter from front to back, and it still sounds laugh-like. I'm sure if you, if you did an uh, empirical test of this, you'd say it's different. But uh, think about how different laugh uh, speech would be if you played it backwards as opposed to ha 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 backwards, it's still pretty much ha 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 backwards, and the hard uh, onset, ha, uh, largely has to do, I think, with a, uh, uh, you know, the, tra the rapid transient. So you hear ha, if you play it backwards, you'll hear ha from the other side. Okay, one, one of the nice features of laughter is its contagion. Most people, when they hear a sound of laughter, 
uh, will replicate the sound. Now this suggests that we have a neural mechanism for the detection of the sound uh, and also the replication of the sound. When you hear another person laugh, you don't think, huh, I think I ought to do that too. <laughs> you know, just, okay, you just sort of do it automatically. So I believe that we have a generator uh, for sounds of speech. So we're talking about something that has been identified in the calls of other animals and so on. We're dealing with laughter, we're dealing with a, a human call. Uh, it also has the interesting property of the individual hearing it will op often replicate that. So I believe that there's a, a detector, a pattern generator, and a feature detector. Uh, you're unlikely to develop this for more difficult uh, vocalizations. However, if you look at the basic phonemic structure of speech, we talk about the, uh, the deep structure of speech, uh, you're uh, dealing with something probably at a similar level here, but you're more likely to identify it with something as, as homogeneous and simple in structure uh, as laughter. I'm going to move on now uh, to one of our close cousins here. This is the common chimp. Uh, this is the play face of a, a young chimp. If you tickle them, uh, they perform uh, the, the, uh, this face and uh, they will uh, provide their own uh, special uh, laughter. Uh, Darwin called this laughter and chuckles. He had uh, Jane Goodall, uh, Penny Patterson with the gorillas, <laughs> Diane Fossey referred uh, to these sounds as laughter. But if you take sounds of chimpanzee laughter and play it to class, I did this with two large lecture classes and gave them a note card to say, describe what you heard. I think uh, two people out of about 200 said laughter. And I think uh, these were some sneaky people that somehow <laughs> had learned what I was up to. Uh, I had to pick uh, some classes. It was early in the semester and like freshman classes where these people would unlikely know anything about me. Okay, so chimp laughter doesn't sound like laughter. I'll give you a picture of it and then we're going to make the sound in a moment. Okay, uh, this is the frequency spe spectrum of human laughter. Uh, it's quite stereotyped. In fact, it's hard to perform laughter in other than this form. For example, we typically laugh, <laughs> okay, something of that order. Uh, I refer to it stereotyped, it's certainly not fixed. And I'm not suggesting there's not individual differences. I'm not suggesting there aren't context differences. Uh, but uh, we're dealing with uh, something that at best I think we should consider uh, individual differences as variation on a theme. If everyone laughed in a different way, we wouldn't know what they were doing, okay? So those people say, oh, there's endless varieties. If there's endless varieties, you wouldn't know what it was. And also, I think as an exercise here, there's also neuromuscular constraints on the kind of sounds that we can make. So if typical laughter is, <laughs> okay, give it a try to laugh with a short haw sound. Hut, 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 hut. Okay, on three, everyone give it a try here. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Doesn't sound very really like. Okay, now, now have a longer haw sound. So we'll have like, ha, ha, ha. Okay, one, two, three. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, now I have the normal haw sound, but shorten the enter note interval. This one's really hard. Like, <laughs> I, I have throat trouble. By the way, laughing's bad for your voice. <laughs> but these things, uh, there, so there's big constraints on laughing in other than the usual way. Okay, here's the chimp laughter. Uh, there's been some other reports in the last few years. Uh, contrasting human laughter with that of the chimps. But uh, about 10 years earlier, we made the same distinction. And when all said and done, I noticed that they basically same, that came to the same conclusion we did. Uh, and that's basically the chimp and other primates have a noisier laugh sound than we do. Oh, great. A noisier sound than we do. 
Notice that you don't have the harmonic structure. We have the, uh, the stacks of harmonics. It's noisy. And also, it's a, it's a panning sound. I'll give you an example here that was recorded at uh, uh, Yerkes Primate Research Center. I'm actually assistant in some of this. Collection of this work was uh, Kim Bard. That's chimp laughter. Okay. Uh, clearly doesn't sound like ha ha ha. And uh, for people in the room here, I think that you would find dating difficult if you laughed with this particular pattern. Yeah, you think everything was going great <laughs> until the <laughs> okay. Okay, <clears throat> plots starting to thicken here. When I first uh, uh, recorded these, I was able to put put my hand down on the belly of the chimp. Notice, but I was on the other side of the fence here. The reason is uh, if I didn't have the fence there, and these chimps got hold of the video equipment. Uh, you might not get it back, or you wouldn't get it back the same way that uh, it was when they took it. Okay, but if you uh, tickle the chimp, you find <laughs> that kind of sound. Okay, the best way to demonstrate this is to put your hand in your abdomen. Okay, now pant like a dog. <laughs> okay, it's one sound per inward and outward breath. Now keep your hand there and go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> okay? You don't get that anymore. So it's like when you're talking, you have uh, pressure in the constant pressure, the uh, abdomen, and you're chopping uh, the exhalation. The chimps are doing it. <laughs> okay, this was interesting. Uh, gorillas, uh, orangs, uh, bonobos, uh, produce pretty much the same vocalization, although some of them uh, may show a touch more voicing. It's less noisy. Yeah? How about uh, babies, human babies? They sounded a little bit more like chimps. Uh, human babies start to perform a pretty normal uh, laughter at about uh, three to four months. Unlike crying that's present at birth, uh, laughter is more recently evolved and as often associated with recently evolved characters, they develop late. So laughter uh, develops after uh, vocal crying. Uh, okay, so you have the chopped exhalation in human laughter and you have the uh, abdominal heaving. Uh, okay, well this tells us something very important about the, uh, the difference between human and uh, chimpanzee laughter. But I think the uh, important thing is why does this difference exist? I started to think about this, and the key, the key is a respiratory control that came with walking upright on two legs. Okay, and the insight here came from a uh, science paper about 10 or 15 years ago by Bramble and Courier at the University of Utah. And they were looking at the relationship uh, between stride and breathing in a variety of mammals. In all quadrupeds, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between stride and breathing. And the reason for this is they have to have full lungs uh, to uh, brace themselves against forelimb uh, four impacts. This is also true of chimpanzees, uh, that well, they can stand upright on two legs in terms of respiratory uh, locomotion, they're quadrupeds. So you have the one-to-one -one link between running. It's important to get the hell out of there 
you need that bracing. But when you stand up on two legs, it frees the thorax not only to manipulate objects in front of the uh, body, uh, uh, to hold babies, uh, to throw spears, to throw rocks, to do these kind of things. Uh, but something had been completely ignored was make the fancy sounds of laughter and speech. So when you free the, uh, the respiratory apparatus, the thorax, of its mechanical control function, you can get these fancy uh, changes. And there's associated changes in the spinal cord uh, related to this. Uh, linguists and phoneticians seem to completely ignore this because linguistics is basically a neck up endeavor. They don't pay attention to lowly issues about breathing and respiratory control. And uh, that's, I think, that's where the action is. You know, where have you heard about this proposition before? It's just basically they do not think about these things. So, in starting with laughter, uh, contrasting human laughter with chimp laughter, which is, again, we're at the basically the descriptive level. They're different. Why are they different? It probably has to do with uh, the bipedal locomotion. When we walk upright in two legs, we have all sorts of different ratios between stride and breathing. And then the next uh, step, and I thought the exciting one, is that what we've learned about laughter also tells us uh, something about why we can talk, these animals can't. I never anticipated this because I guess violating a lot of the ways that people typically do science are the kind of things we apply uh, for grants to do. You have a, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, as opposed to following the trail wherever it leads. And the kind of thing we're doing here is, again, finding something that humans do that no other animals can do, and then ask the question about what that change is. This is a very different approach than you have in population genetics where you're selecting for or against traits, which are kind of abstract approach. Uh, not that pop there's any problem with population genetics, but it's not going to get to the issue of the more evo-devo issues about what happened to that nerve fiber, what happened to that neurotransmitter, what happened to that brain structure. And I think doing these kind of things, looking at things like uh, unique, uh, uniquely human tears, uniquely human whites of the eyes, and uh, some other things on our list, it'll get us to uh, places we'd never, never otherwise get. I'd like to end here with a couple of videos, if I get them to play. You might enjoy. This, this, isn't, uh, this isn't a case of how collected our data, which uh, our public data was surreptitious observations of people. But uh, here's uh, what we learned from simply talking to some people in public places. And what they did. Okay, this, uh, this is from a public uh, area uh, around Harbor Place in Baltimore. Okay. 
Okay, and one more. This is an illustration of the power of contagious laughter. Uh, we're tapping a laugh box, which is also the same technology you see in uh, laugh tracks of television situation comedies. Uh, but something that uh, I had found absent in the psychological literature, there was quite a bit of research about the contagion uh, of laughter, uh, but they're dealing with things like sex effect, personality. You know, they never dealt with the fact that laughter could cause laughter. There wasn't really a category in psychology. And we found that uh, the sound of laughter itself is good at replicating the sound that you hear. Okay, that, that's it. I'm glad to entertain any questions you have. Good. Yeah, so, some things to think about as anthropologists is that you can get important insights in the brain by simply observing what people do. And uh, this is also the kind of work that can be done by uh, undergraduates. Instead of most of my uh, paper's uh, co-authors are undergraduates. And uh, I was seeking some projects in which they could participate as opposed to electrophysiology where a week of, or uh, a year of hard work in the lab would get them to the point of starting. So this was fun. Uh, you can get it off, uh, uh, get it off the mark easily. It's also the kind of thing that's adaptable in clinical settings. Uh, one of the most uh, common uh, symptoms of brain damage is inappropriate or, uh, inappropriate or abnormal affect. Uh, what we're talking about is inappropriate or abnormal laughter, uh, but clinicians almost never mention what that is. You're going to say, is it the context in which it was produced? Uh, is it its relation to speech? Is it the dimension of contagiousness? Is it the sound of the vocalization itself? They don't deal with these kind of things because they just say, you know, uh, laughs in, uh, inappropriately. Uh, so you have important clinical things. Uh, also, the contagiousness factor is important. We've done a lot of work on this with yawning. Uh, autistic and schizophrenic individuals uh, are deficient in their ability to yawn uh, contagiously, although they might yawn. So here we have a way of assessing the neurological status of an individual by looking at behavior. And so some people think, well, I don't want to do this kind of stuff with, uh, you know, baseline thing. I want to, I want to deal with clinical cases. 
Uh, but basically, this is the baseline that allows you to go into the clinic. This is also the kind of material that you need uh, to do the cross-cultural studies. Because until you get a concrete version about what's the sound, what's the context, what's the degree of contagiousness, uh, you're not going to uh, really know what to look for. So those of you going off in the field, this is, tells you some kind of things that you can attend to. Yes, Marty. Um, so I know that you might not want to do the gender studies thing, but I'm curious to hear what you think is going on with those sex differences, especially given that um, collaborators elsewhere around the globe seem to be documenting very similar patterns. Um, and one of the reasons I'm interested in that just because I'm interested in sex differences, but, but I'm also interested in that because I wonder if it can tell us something about the function of laughter. Uh, that's intriguing. Actually, I wanted to stay away from that. because. I'm sure. As, as you all know, <laughs> uh, the media love these stories. So we've done all the morning shows, all the news magazines, the 2020s, all that stuff. And they always want you to speak to those kind of issues. And uh, it's an interesting issue. But I, my approach here was simply let the data drive it to me. Let other people walk down this hazardous path. Uh, you're, you're not going to make me engage you in a, a Pueblo-style debate, are you? <laughs> No, but the what what would your take what would your take on this be? No, you know, I'm sitting over here puzzling about it myself. I mean, I think that you know, I mean, I'm, I think I might be able to come up with a story about typical gender roles, you know, locally. But if this is something that you do around the globe, then I think that you know that that, that begs more questions. Yeah, this is also an issue brought up with Helen Fisher. Is obviously the, the nice thing about looking at laughter, since it's under a low level of conscious control, is that it, it's a so-called honest signal. It's hard to lie with it. And, uh, you know, it's hard to lie with crying. It's hard to lie with laughter. And so people are telling you what they really think. So if you go to a party, you, you know, one kind of thing is that, you know, you can tell what people think about each other. How close are they standing to each other? It's always a bad omen in a relationship when one of the parties is like, <laughs> always, okay, close is good, eye contact's good, laughter's good, and one of the things that we found is that the laughter of the woman is the key. Women don't care if the guy laughs at all. Uh, we did a, a study of uh, six national newspapers back when they had uh, personal ads. They don't want it anymore, this stuff's online. When the personal ads uh, found a particular day in April and compared all these ads and look uh, where anyone mentioned humor or sense of humor or loves to laugh and things like that. Uh, overwhelmingly, women were requesting uh, males uh, with a good sense of humor or loves to laugh and so on. Uh, men were sort of offering it, saying, I have a good sense of humor. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, along with, you know, the traditional kind of things, like, you know, David Buss's list of things, uh, you find that uh, men are often interested in youth and beauty, uh, pretty much cross-culturally, and uh, women basically are offering it. But another thing that's going on is uh, men are offering a sense of humor and women are in the market for it. There's no marketplace unless there's buyer and sellers, okay. Uh, but men, and this goes back to some work of uh, Carl uh, I. Leibelsfeld and Carl Grammer, is uh, uh, young uh, German uh, people meeting in a lab situation for the first time, is uh, men were attracted to women who laughed in their, par uh, in their uh, presence or where they laughed uh, conjointly. Uh, women were attracted to men that made them laugh. And this is like would they be interested in requesting contact information after the thing. So, so basically, uh, we, uh, women like men with a good sense of humor who make them laugh, and men offer it. So you could have a guy that's known for a great sense of humor, and he might never laugh. Okay. Uh, you could also say that looking at these laugh par uh, patterns might give some insight into the whole alpha male kind of things. But uh, again, I uh, preferred not to go down that particular path, although I think it's obvious. One. Would, you, would you care to offer something? 
another paper by one of your contemporaries, because it was, sort of, I think it came out in, in uh, about the same time that your laughter punctuates speech work came out. But it showed that, um, like, that there were status differences in who was withholding the laughter. Um, and so, you know, it was, I think it was done in like a hospital setting. Is that, is that your paper? Uh, you must be familiar with it. Well, I, just, I just told you, I just, I just told you the pattern. I'm sorry. Okay, when you talked about uh, withholding, I think the problem here is that when you're dealing with something under a low level of control, it's basically an honest signal, and uh, the, these things are uh, uh, coming through, I think, regardless of your intent. I think this is one of the reasons why people uh, don't commit what I call the error of intentionality. Uh, I was sort of driven to think about these things uh, by uh, trying to understand the laughter, because so many of the analyses of laughter would take a transcript and say, the person laughed here because of this, and then, first of all, you should never take a person's word for why they do these things, because it's not under conscious control or under very little. And, uh, and I think when you get into microanalyses of transcripts, uh, the problem becomes even greater. So I'd say, you know, avoid the error of intentionality, you know, what I call philosopher's disease, uh, the attempt to rationalize the irrational. So what we're dealing with is basically, you know, the primitive human behavior that you can see right here in the here and now. Uh, so you don't, you don't have to go to the forest of Gombe to study chimpanzee. Behavior you can study, we're one of the three chimpanzees, right? Uh, you can go to the student union and, and study the local chimpanzees or your colleagues. push you a little bit on the statement that you just repeated that you made throughout the talk, which is that it's not under conscious control, right? So um, the fact that people are uncomfortable laughing when requested to do so, and comfortable laughing spontaneously when they look at someone with whom they're familiar in the context of unusual circumstances, which are the anecdotes that you showed us, that doesn't mean that the behavior is not under conscious control. Um, uh, instead, what I think is a plausible possibility is that there are really two behaviors which you're calling all laughter, and one of them is volitional and the other is not. Um, and uh, people can laugh on command, they're just social norms that make it an uncomfortable request, right? So they'll often refuse. Um, uh, but the question is whether their laughing on command is the same as their spontaneous laughter. Uh, good, good question. I, I mean, I'm worried about this too. That, that's why the last time I mentioned this, I said under a low level. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, laughing is not a matter of speaking ha-ha. So that's why I would say lower level. And uh, there's a lot of interlocking pieces to these kind of things. For example, we're not conscious of when we breathe during speech. You don't think, oh, running out of air, now i got to stop and take a breath. But we do this. You know, so you go through life alternating breathing and speaking. You plan it. Uh, I think this is something rather like that. Uh, so I think uh, very often, I think social scientists treat laughing as speaking ha-ha. I think it's less than that. I, I wouldn't say it's unconscious. I'm not quite sure what that is. Right, that, so that wasn't my point. What, what, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're tempering the strength of your original claim, but you're not changing the original claim. My, my conjecture is that there are two different things that you're calling the same. There's one that is using the speech apparatus to mimic or emulate the spontaneous laughter. And that's entirely under conscious control. Yes. And then there's the spontaneous laughter, which is largely within the constraints that you've described, not under conscious control. Um, so the fact that people don't laugh on command doesn't mean that they can't emulate, if you will. And Similarly, a lot of the laughter that you see in the wild may be emulation and not spontaneous. Uh, uh, how would you define emulation? Well, so they're using the consciously controlled vocal apparatus. And here, I mean, Greg is the authority. I'm really you know, drawing on most of what I know I've learned from him. Um, they're, they're using the vocal apparatus, which is under conscious control, to produce something that sounds reasonably like the spontaneously produced laughter. And they're often doing so in, as a social lubricant in situations that have nothing to do with the, the elicitors of genuine laughter. 
So they're laughing because it's polite, or because they're uncomfortable, or because they're putting scare quotes around something they've said, or because they want to temper the strength of something they've said. Uh, and that's not the same as um, uh, they are experiencing mirth. Uh, that sounds reasonable. Uh, again, we're going down a path here that actually I would prefer not to engage in some respects. Because I am simply uh, would suggest that the laughter is under a lower level of conscious control, and a lot of things are. Uh, I think we're not conscious of when we're not conscious. So basically, when we describe uh, you know, the motives for what we're doing, we're describing a fairly uh, small amount. Uh, you know, there's uh, a movement uh, in you know, animal rights and so on, and is to attributing more of emotional life and uh, cognition and consciousness to animals than we usually do. You know, they're not on autonomous. Uh, I, I think there's a justification in doing that, but I think we should also uh, be concerned with attributing more uh, to conscious control and volitional th 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 than we're due to. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. And uh, no, I, I look forward to how this plays out. Yeah, I think, I mean, the conscious unconscious distinction is hairy. I, I think there's a better way to think about it and just look at what physiological systems are actually engaged when the thing's produced. And I think, so you have so-called conscious, deliberate, volitional laughter is created unconsciously, so to speak. We're not aware that we're doing it, but it's produced by the system that's the same system that's controlling the speech that we're producing. So I'm not really necessarily conscious of all the speech I'm producing either, but it's now, here created by this particular system. And, and so, you know, Sophie Scott and Carol McGettigan, they've been doing stuff yeah, lately, yeah. really showing specifically what areas are engaged, both in the production and mm -hmm. perception of, you know, this volitional, spontaneous distinction Dan's talking about. Yeah. And it that, seems to be about... It's interesting. So it, and it doesn't really map onto conscious, unconscious. I think that categorization might be... Yeah, I just like this. Uh, up whole the, business about uh, voluntary and voluntary sure. conscious. Sure. No, I mean, and I know what your point is with the behavior keyboard. And, by the way, the, the, hey, uh, this was basically done as, uh, uh, was also interested in uh, possible clinical ramifications of some of this to take into the clinic. Kind of things you can just do with a stopwatch and say, you know, do something or other now. And also to deal with some of these issues that have been brought up. Uh, I appreciate reaction time is a, a crude instrument and so on, but I think it can make some of the points. Like if you ask someone to blink, you know, it can be done uh, quite quickly. Thing is, you move this way, longer reaction times, I'd say it's harder to play. Uh, smile. Actually, this is an interesting one, given the fact of both the, you know, Ekman's uh, false and true smiles. Actually, I just did a, actually a couple days ago, just sent the chapter in. As a, Ekman has a chapter, too. It's a, it's a new book on facial expression and so on, wrestling with some of these issues. Uh, you know, I would take issue, and Ekman might agree with this now, is... Uh, the so-called false smiles, I'd say, are real smiles. It's basically you have two classes of thing. One is an instrumental, you know, Skinnerian instrumental smile, which is, uh, yeah, but I think it's real. It's a powerful instrument in uh, discourse. And then you've got the felt smile. Uh, also, uh, uh, Matt Gervais and Wilson, in their quarterly view of biology paper, made a distinction between uh, Duchenne and uh, non-Duchenne uh, laughs. And I think a similar issue, a similar issue is going on there. And uh, so the, the, the fake smiles are real smiles. And I think uh, the fake laugh or the false laughs or the instrumental laughs are real laughs too. And again, I'd say different areas, it's a different process. And uh, one of the big issues of facial expressions is that you have uh, study of uh, facial postures. It's not facial behaviors. I think it'd be completely different if you had people doing this research trained in neurophysiology. Because smiling is an act of smiling. Uh, frowning is an act of frowning. And yet all the research is done on still pictures. And uh, even when they go into microanalyses of the muscles involved in facial, basic special, uh, facial expressions, you, uh, you're dealing with simply uh, contraction of particular muscles in that. They throw away time. And time's a critical thing. So a neurophysiologist would say, how is a smile produced? It, it goes beyond simply a microanalysis of involved muscles. 
So no one doing this research uh, looks at time. That, that's another dimension that's really important. Yeah. This is a bit clinical, but I wanted to know, has anyone done studies on laughter in split brain patients? Yes. In fact, that's one of the most intriguing uh, cases of uh, laughter not under conscious control. Or uh, people will be laughing, and you say, why do you laugh? And they'll make up a story about it. So the split brain people do this all the time. So I say a lot of times we're, we're laughing. We make up narratives to explain, uh, yeah, it's basically fictitious. Uh, split brain people do this uh, reliably. So hey, when you're laughing, it's like you're a split brain person. <laughs> but no, that, that's a particularly good uh, case, and I use that one in my book. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking that um, laughter is um, in, in everyday, you know, interaction. It's it's much uh, a social action, and as a social kind of glue or something like that. So w one way of thinking is that, that uh, it's continuum of a, uh, of a, like a spontaneous laugh, like when a baby laughs, it's spontaneous and baby doesn't think about why, it, why it's laughing. And, and uh, a fake kind of fake laugh if you like laugh your boss's joke or something like that. So, but it's a social thing. But if, if you ask somebody to laugh, it's not so social. It's uh, an individual doing <coughs> the task. So, so in that uh, example where there were these two men in the car, so they were laughing together. So it's it was a yeah, that was intriguing. They're looking at. Uh, all these cases I find when you left it, it, it's like uh, I looked at the laughter behavior of people like in concourses at airports where they're walking side by side. There's very little laughter. Uh, you get laughter when they stop and face each other. That's why if you, if you go to the mall, go to the food court, people walking down the aisles are side by side and they don't see each other. So basically, you need to stop and look at each other. And that's why uh, uh, several of these cases I had at Harbor Place in Baltimore is because you had uh, people at noon time, uh, they had free time, they were not under uh, time pressure, uh, they were uh, facing each other, and that's why those are uh, good places. So, uh, The nice thing about some of this is, let's say we have a film crew comes in and wants to do a documentary about these things, I can say, we'll go to this place, and yeah, but we, I said, believe me, we do these things, it's almost as if you script it. Uh, but the interesting thing is that you have behavior that's so predictable, it almost seems lawful. doesn't mean it's under conscious control. Yeah. Um, so do you have a quasi-functional functional story for why speakers laugh more at their own speech acts? Uh, <coughs> uh, no, we don't. <laughs> but the, you know, if we look at the, uh, there may be some hints coming from the evolution of laughter, which I believe is, uh, laughter is the sound of labored breathing of rough and tumble play, such that <laughs> like animals chasing each other and tickling each other, they're producing this sound. And then I believe through the process which ethologists called uh, ritualization, uh, the sound came to sa uh, stand for the circumstance, it means this is play, I'm not att uh, attacking you. And I believe that's where it really started. It means it's a playful social uh, without another individual there. I mean, 30 times, I love those kind of numbers. I mean, social science, 30 time difference. You guys say, yeah, but is that significant? You know? uh, 30 times. I think that's when you're, as you mentioned, uh, the social dimension. I can't think of anything that's more social. It's different than crying, which is another one that's even harder than laughing. Like the crying of the behavioral keyboard was way over there. If you ask someone to cry, you're not able to do it. In fact, that's why we have method acting. Since people can't do it in command, you try to put yourself in an emotional state by imagining it, where you can do these kind of things. It gives you a path uh, through to these things that you couldn't immediately access. So that's what me, uh, method acting is about. Can I just follow up on that? Because I was thinking that you could have I mean, I hadn't, I, didn't, I hadn't thought too much about this before, but you know, you can imagine one kind of situation that's, let's call it manipulation, right? So if, if laughing makes you feel good and it makes you like the other, I mean, because you've showed this, these data that suggest that if I laugh at you, I like you, or maybe 
maybe you ha I would have to be a woman and you'd have to be a man or something like that. But, it, but, but I mean, because if, if there's some sort of virtue of getting other people to laugh at you, and laughter is contagious, then you could have a story that says, I'm just going to start laughing. And I start talking, and then not only do you laugh. Uh, and yeah, uh, by the way, laughing is a potential One of the uh, big uh, issues, and I, I, I've done, I wanted to do more. I, I didn't do enough to, to warrant a study, but I was interested in brain damage people, mostly for uh, brain damage, returning mm -hmm. uh, to the workplace. And uh, particularly if you're working around other people, uh, it so freaks out other people when you laugh inappropriately. Let's assume it's a che checkout person, it's a safe way. And they just start to laugh. <laughs> okay, and uh, or uh, or cry, and uh, so we're dealing with uh, some uh, very important uh, uh, clinical issues here. Actually, looking at the many aspects of the laughter, actually, I, I wrote a book, uh, <laughs> a life ruining experience. My my <laughs> wife is here, <laughs> Helen, who suffered through uh, proofreading some of my drafts. Uh, what I wanted to do was to tell it in long form. It is about, uh, like the second chapter was the path not taken, which was the philosophical path. And also it didn't look at humor, because laughter is a fact, humor is conjecture. I, I want to stay away from um, you know, some of these issues. Uh, and so uh, what do people do in natural places? How did it evolve? That's another chapter. Another one is, uh, contagious laughter, everything from the ancient Greeks, uh, where they basically planted people in the audience to, to laugh and cheer and cry, uh, right up to present uh, Tobin's situation comedy. Had a chapter on laughter and music, uh, laughter and the clinic, uh, all these kind of things. Uh, since the story I was trying to tell uh, involved so many scattered elements, that's why I bring them together in a book, and my most recent book called Curious Behavior, Yawning, Laughing, Hiccuping, and Beyond, Way Beyond Fix. Uh, what I wanted to bring together is a lot of these kind of things that were on the behavioral keyboard. We're not only uh, talking about laughter, we're contrasting laughter, uh, contagious laughter with contagious yawning, with contagious itching, with contagious vomiting, all these kind of things. How are they similar? How are they different? And I can assure you that, well, this is very time consuming because none of these people are going to contrast these things. Uh, let's say like vocal crying is so specific that people that look at crying of adults never look at crying of babies and vice versa. Uh, people who are expert at itching never talk about scratching. And yet a scratch is a response to an itch. You have career long scratch researchers not only don't uh, talk about itch, they seem not to even be curious about it. And uh, also it's an opportunity to bring up uh, an issue that I'm sure you've all been thinking about, not only laughter and speech, but why uh, we evolved the capacity to talk through our mouth and not through our butt. You, you haven't been thinking about this? Because after all, the vocal folds are simply a valve that keep food and water out of the airway. Very clunky, all things can go wrong. I'm having trouble speaking the last few weeks. Uh, so what you have is a structure that evolved in one service uh, being uh, used for another, it's making fancy sounds. Why not another, uh, another valve at the other end that uh, occasional amongst uh, certain individuals, actually people of this age group, uh, probably fart between 18 and 30 times a day. Uh, why didn't we evolve the capacity to speak through that, or if us using uh, that particular valve? I think I have a chapter about that, too. What's the answer? <laughs> uh, well, it has to do, I think it has to do with control. And actually, uh, there's limited capacities. If you look at, uh, I was actually looking for individuals who had extraordinary uh, competence to uh, make sounds through the other orifice, for example, the famous lepetamine that uh, around the uh, turn of the 19th, uh, turn of the 20th century was the biggest money earner at uh, the world's most famous nightclub, Moulin Rouge. It was a farting act, and he would fart out all sorts of sounds and imitate all sorts of sounds. Fart along with music. Uh, this was kind of impressive. But the, uh, we never had an opportunity to see if he could 
uh, train his powers of speech. Uh, even going back, and of course, interested in the historical thing, is none other than St. Augustine in his City of God. Uh, had uh, found an, uh, encountered on the road someone that had such remarkable capacity uh, to modulate his heart that he was saying as this was a unique measure of spiritual enlightenment. <laughs> this is another area that is completely open to anthropology. <laughs> okay. um, Actually, uh, tickling has a lot of uh, uh, tremendously fascinating things about it. it is, uh, it's often tr uh, treated as a reflex, but it's not a reflex like a uh, patellar tendon reflex. It is that I actually did a study of who tickles who. Um, almost 500 subjects in this one, I believe. Uh, you do not, when's the last time uh, anyone in here has been tickled by a stranger? Uh, you tickle friends, family, lovers. So it's really uh, a kind of communication. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't tickle strangers, although they might be able to tickle you. Uh, so there's all sorts of intriguing things. Also an intriguing thing is after the age of 40, you found that tickling and being tickled decreases 10 times. You can think about that one. Marty, where'd you go? <laughs> uh, but uh, tickling is also fascinating, as I believe it was the ancestral stimulus for laughter. Uh, the most nice candidate for the most ancient joke would be feign tickle, the I'm going to get you. You don't actually tickle a person, because then it would be more reflexive. But that would be my candidate for the most ancient joke. Not a fart? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, that used to be religion. <laughs> I, I don't know. If a, I don't know if a fart would cause laughter, but uh, well, people are under such control over it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, tickling also is intriguing. Uh, a, a point, uh, a valid point made by Aristotle was that uh, you know it takes another person to tickle. You can't tickle yourself. But uh, starting with that. Uh, this means that if you can define what a stimulus for tickle is, you've defined what other is. So the neural mechanism of tickle is really, you know, something that's not me contacting the surface of the body. When you define that, you have also resolved one of the most ancient and interesting philosophical issues about what is the neurological basis for self and other. So something that's ticklish is other. And what's not other is you. And this brings up the whole issue, is how do you define what's the borders of your body? You're sitting in a chair over here. But uh, how much of your body, you basically generated this. I mean, Ramachandran had gotten into some of this. But you have a vague, very vague sense of the rest of your body. You're sitting here in a chair. You have a defined view about where your buttocks have contacted the chair. You're going to have legs. The, no, it's just based. <laughs> okay, if your underwear fits properly, you should have... No, but basically you generate uh, periodically the sketchy map of your body. And uh, again, it's like uh, the way it really is is completely different uh, than you know, common sense suggests. I wanted to just take a stab at Erica's question before then she can ask her other because she has another one, I think. I do. Um, but I think I have looked at that a little bit about when people laugh relative to, in the case of irony at least, and it seems to happen a little more after than before, which is different than what you might expect based on what you're saying. It's not a play battle. It's a right. different, little different than a play battle, but I think it functions similarly, but it, it's, there's something about, the, I think, the, the 
the comprehension processes that happen and the timing in relation to the comprehension processes are important. And I think there could be a mix of strategies that people could use and it would be all over the place because it's complicated and what kinds of implicature people might draw in different kinds of speech acts. So I think it can function as a play bow and not necessarily proceed it like a play bow. Because with a play bow, it's not like there's a lot of complicated processing has to happen after that in the receiver. It's just when I bite you, don't think I'm really attacking. It's different than understanding an irony, for example. So you might expect some different timing. Yeah, well, yawning, another behavior you looked at is um, yawn's usually done after. It's usually a rude signal of, you know, you're boring or I'm sleepy or, you know, you can feign, uh, you can feign a yawn, but you can't uh, usually produce a natural yawn. Uh, also, some superficial things we've noticed is uh, if you contrast a yawn and a sneeze, actually, in many respects, uh, a sneeze is a fast yawn. Uh, so if you do videotapes and you play uh, games with the uh, speed, uh, yawning and sneezing are, are quite similar. And they both resolve, uh, resolve in a kind of climax. Okay? Uh, a yawn doesn't have the explosive exhalation of a sneeze. But then again, sneezes are common to coughing, which also has a contagious problem, another behavior we've been looking at. And also, if yawning and uh, sneezing seem somewhat similar, you can contrast them with a the facial expression during orgasm. Uh, some particularly good examples of this, if you ever see uh, ads for allergy, uh, nasal sprays or allergy medications, where a person's like, with their head back sort of like getting ready to see, you can think, have I seen that face somewhere before? Uh, uh, and some people might think, we just can't throw out the, I think, no, of course you can throw them out. It's an interesting idea. Maybe it's false. Uh, but the fact is, when we're looking at these things evolutionarily, I think that, you know, uh, sort of Mother Nature has this basic tool kept, and these elemental things are patched together in different ways. You know, so a sneeze, a sneeze has a lot in common with a cough. A cough is under operant control, but not sneezes. Uh, sneezes are mostly clearing the nasal airway, although typically not with humans. Um, so coughing is a way that you can do it in command. There are reflexive coughs. So basically, you can cough. Uh, you can cough in command, and that's important, as opposed to waiting around for a sneeze. If an uh, insect's crawling up your, uh, your nose, you need to clear the mucus or something like that. Now, there's this whole family of things having to do with a whole range of different kind of control. And so that's why you know, I think looking at sneezes in forms about coughs, coughs in forms about sneezes, and all these things are related in ways that uh, I think people really haven't uh, thought about. You had a follow up, right? I do. Well, it's, it's a different question. Different question. Okay. okay. Um, I was wondering, so maybe you mentioned this in the beginning, I couldn't have insight, I'm sorry, but um, I was wondering what element of contagious laughter is contagious? So I'm thinking specifically of the deaf, the blind, the deaf blind, people who laugh in social groups, but who are missing at least one of the sort of modalities that, that you could prove uh. laughter. Actually, and Greg might be able to better answer some of these. Actually, some of this work has just come out in the last couple of years about uh, what sounds of laughter are more contagious. It seems like a laughter that has more variability as opposed to more stereotyped. Uh, more energy. Yeah. More arousal. And it sounds arousing. I would say. So like anything in a, deaf, like in a, in a like group of, of all profoundly deaf people, like they're like people laugh and it spreads, and like people laugh together. So does it? I think they can they can sort of get an idea of the acoustic features through the faces. Okay. So yeah. yeah also, it's really actually, laughing, I, I did a like study. I did a study of. That would make sense. Yeah, uh, I did a study of laughter in uh, contagiously deaf signers. So we talked here about the, this punctuation effect. I wanted to look about what about people uh, who can see the other perk, see their conversant, but can't hear them. And also, it's a way of signers, you do, don't have competition for the vocal apparatus. You know, because I, I think if you have punctuation between, you know, laughter punctuates speech, it doesn't interrupt phrase structure. 
I thought, well, is it a lower level issue of competing for the apparatus of vocal expression? Are we dealing with a higher level issue? I think we're dealing with a higher level linguistic issue uh, because uh, when you have vocals, uh, when you have vocally laughing signers, there's no competition uh, for the motor apparatus. And then, you know, some other things that we looked at is, yeah, you, you still have punctuation when you can uh, hear but not see your audience, such as with the telephone or when you, uh, again, pushing it a bit, but I thought, hey, it's a piece of the puzzle that I like to see. Uh, the punctuation exists when uh, you have emoticon placement in text messages. Yes, emoticons appear, don't break phrase structure. And you say, yeah, well, that's a stylistic thing. I think, yeah, but there are all these pieces of the puzzle. And also, breathing uh, uh, speech, uh, breathing punctuates speech. So you have this whole family of things. I think we're, we're dealing with a very fundamental uh, inner uh, locking uh, pattern. And I would speak with much less confidence that I was speaking to one of these as opposed to five of them. One, one last question. One, yeah. Yes. Um, so, as far as back to your question about um, studying either deaf or blind um, patients, what, what if you did a combination of a, a deaf and blind patient? So what if you tried to tickle them? Would they laugh? And if they didn't, would laughing be some semi socially learned? Well, actually, uh, there's been at least two, uh, two studies by uh, Daniel X. Freeman at uh, University of Chicago and uh, Ivo Ivelsfeldt had looked at uh, deaf-blind individuals, and uh, they, they, they have spontaneous laughter and smiling. And of course, they would, they would respond to uh, tickling. There's also, just an add-on to it, uh, Tara Edwards has done a study of deaf-blind um, looking at how they share laughter in moments, where they basically take someone else's hand and put it on their throat when they're mm -hmm. laughing in groups. It's part of like, the new science system that's been emerging. Mm -hmm. and so I don't know if it's a cool way of getting around. Also, I think the, the vocal sign for uh, laughter is like the pulsing abdomen. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, when he found uh, the uh, punctuation exists in congenitally deaf signers, uh, it also, uh, you also uh, see the same gender effects. So male, uh, male congenitally deaf signers are uh, still the major laugh getters. Again, I'm always interested in the pieces of the puzzle. Actually, the, the deaf signer thing took me about 15 years to get that, <laughs> the pieces of that thing together. That's the kind of thing, do not do this before tenure. <laughs> but it's the kind of thing, you always have it in the back burner and every time a case and opportunity, you pursue it. And then, you know, you know over a few years, uh, you know, these, these things come together. But I, I think if you can do them and then you have the cross-cultural uh, comparative thing, it, it makes uh, for race. A strong uh, research program. Also, very hard to do. You know, who's going to fund this? A multi-year, multidisciplinary. Everyone talks to talk, but uh, who's going to do it? Yeah, you need a uh, you need a rich benefactor and an institute because uh, no one else is going to have the patience. Because a, a lot of the important discoveries are failures in disguise. What are you going to do next? How are you going to do it? Are you going to be able to walk over here? to your neuroscience people and get their attention and assist them to do the part that comes next. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to break through that. Well, on that note, let's thank Bob for...